So we begin uh, <clears throat> from the first speaker, Professor Joao Paulo Costa. You will have to come to the podium, Professor Costa. So I'll, I'll take over from here and, and welcome uh, Professor Joao Paulo Costa. First of all, thank you so much for coming all the way here. Uh, professor Costa is a professor of history, uh, of the history department in Nova Lisbon, Portugal. His main interests are maritime history, construction of early modern global cities and oceanic networks. He's the coordinator of the UNESCO chair, the Oceans Heritage. The discussant is going to be Professor Helen Wutan, who will join us by video conferencing. She's the associate professor at the University of Sud. Université de France. She specializes on the study of missionaries in and around Japan in the 16th and 17th century. We are really looking forward to your talk, um, Professor Costa, about the first ship that linked uh, India directly to Japan. As you see, there's a lot of uh, feeling about the free and open Indo-Pacific nowadays, and this was, uh, you know, probably the first voyage of the sort. The other thing is, I think it is this event that in many ways was a connection between um, Japan and India because of Francis Xavier. You know, he went from Goa and then he lies there. So that's been a very special connect. But over to you. Uh, we look forward to maybe about 20 minutes of your, of, of your, uh, of your talk. And then, of course, we will have our discussion joining us. We might just shorten the question comments because I think we're a little short of time, but over to you, sir. Thank you. So, thank you so Professor much. Costa, please accept this. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> so, first of all, Mr. Ambassador, I, I skipped the introduction because the time is short, but I'm very proud to be here. I'm very honored to put the invitation. I should say the first time I came to New Delhi, it was in January 1989. It was a long time ago, but I was hosted here in the Indian International Center, the same place. So it's uh, very good, very nice. It was not very nice for me to come back to a kind of home I have here in New Delhi. So thank you so much. And you know, I never saw so I India and Japan are the two Asian countries where I have been more time and travel and visited more more times, but I never expected to be invited to talk about your relations, direct relations under my perspective of Portuguese, but I thank you for that. And I, I will try to respect history and so and only a sal a salute warmly my colleague, Ellen Vutan, who is going to make the comments. She was very kind to accept this challenge. Ellen, merci beaucoup pour ta, pour ta gentillesse et pour ce moment en que nous serons ensemble. Uh, well, let's go so to seek out this Kurofune, the first ship which linked India directly to Japan. So first we have to all say that in Lisbon, we have developed studies on these interactions between the Portugal and Japan and through Portugal and Japan about all what is the Asian connections that the Portuguese established in the early modern ages. And we have, uh, we, we published a journal for 20 years, which was called Bulletin of Portuguese Japanese Studies, full in English with uh, summaries in Portuguese and Japanese. And I brought a collection to Japan Foundation. I hope that you may be interested here. So quickly, the, um, the connections between this, this is a Chinese map that I will use in another way. The, this is the idea of the, the belt that uh, China, the Republic of China proposed, but I'm looking at it as the way how Eurasia for millennia is in contact, is inter interacted. The, 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 the Silk Roads are much bigger than that. And for sure, since very early, they also included Japan. This is a, an, a, a, an instrument, but they are the others this is from Persia, from the 17th century, 7th century Persia, but that is are in, in Japanese museums because the Silk Roads had a maritime branch very early. And it, well, it was how Japan became also absorbed Chinese civilization. And through China, most of the Asian civilizations, such as Buddhism, in the 7th and 8th centuries. What the Portuguese did in the 16th century, at the end of the 16th century, by the inaugural voyage of Vasco da Gama, which is shown here in, the, in this, by represented in this, in this um, manuscript, was to add a new, a, new, a, new, a new path to the same Silk Roads. And that had, uh, permitted that Lisbon 
who became in the 16th century a new hub of spices, porcelains, carpets, lacquers, ivories, furnitures, or jewels, as well as a point of departure of so many things. I've studied the topic uh, you invited me to speak about today. I, it is more or less what I did in my master thesis for about 40 years ago. And uh, uh, the first thing that is very interesting, that this is the book where I thought, the, the discovery of Japanese civilization by the Portuguese. I will come to the, the, the topic of the discoveries. But what is interesting to know is that when the Portuguese arrived to Hindi in 1498, uh, they immediately hear about uh, the China. And they start bringing porcelain to Europe, but they didn't hear about Japan. Also to say that the Portuguese never were looking for Sipango or for Katai, despite they knew about the book of Marco Polo and there, there are some copies, there were some copies in Portugal. The, the, the Portuguese experience was experimental. So they were not looking for what tradition was saying, but what the, the, the news they were getting in Asia itself. And so the Portuguese had never heard to Japan, even when they arrived to China, to Canton in 1513. At that time, uh, Japanese external trade was performed especially by Ryukyu people, which were called Lekyus. Le Lekia is uh, uh, the way of saying Ryukyu. And so and the, from 15, 1498 to 1543, when the Portuguese, the first Portuguese arrived to Tadegashima, only a, on, there was only a description of Japan, a sole one, from a Portuguese, Tumé Pires, who was who left, lived in Malacca for two years after the conquest of the city by Alfonso Tobkerke, where he says quickly that the island of Japan, according to the Chinese, is bigger than the biggest of the Ryukyu Islands, and its king is much more powerful. But he and his vassals do not like to trade. He is a pagan king and vassal of the king of China. They have little relations with China because it's too far, and they have no good ships, and they are not a people of the sea. Ryukyu people sails to Japan in seven, eight days and trade gold and copper. Everything that we trade with Ryukyu people comes from Japan and Ryukyu people trades with them textiles from Luzon and other merchandises. So Japan actually was trading and uh, Charles Boxer even mentioned that maybe many of those Ryukyu people that appear, for example, in Malacca, actually they were samurai, that they were not as Japanese, but at the service of uh, Riku trade. So Goa was the basis of, 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 of Portugal in Asia. The city was conquered by Afonso de Albuquerque to the Muslims in 1510 and became officially the capital of the Estado da India, so the Portuguese possessions and uh, influences in, in Asia since 1530. So it was from there that uh, the, the great ship, then the Kurofne, started its voyage after 1550. Just first to, to show that, so the, with this map to remember, that uh, uh, this was the, the area that was performed. So from Goa to Malacca, from Malacca to Macau and Macau to Japan. But that uh, the people, the, the adventurers who discovered Japan, uh, who arrived to Japan and discovered it, of course, in that sense, in 1543 were not uh, Portuguese officials. Uh, the people, the, the, the fellows who arrived to China in 1513, they were at the service of the captain of Malacca. But these people was privateer, were privateers who were making trade, uh, sales, uh, going out of Malacca and were making trade. And finally, in 1543, despite all difficulties they had with the Chinese authorities, they, they, got, they got a way of uh, uh, having an um, ephemeral basis in Fujian. And it was only when the Portuguese were able, due to the monsoon, to have a, an ephemeral, what bases in China that they were able to go uh, farther, farther to uh, arrive to Japan. And they did it in uh, a Chinese junk, not in a Portuguese ship at the, at the first time. So it was something private. And this book that we have here on, on the left is the Peregrinação. It is a, a book of, of one of the one of the who claims to be to have been the first. He was not, but he was second or the third, but he was one of the first for sure. And the episodes that he describes in his peregrination, peregrination look familiar for what we know. It was the, the first uh, interaction between Portuguese and Japanese and of some of the records that, for example, ex uh, were produced by the Otomo family of Funai or Oita nowadays. So in 1543, Japan was introduced in the age of discoveries. I would like to spend a minute with this concept. 
First time I arrived to Japan in 1991, I was told immediately, we didn't discover us because we knew that we exist. Of course, <laughs> of course. Because there, is a mis there was a mistake, not in the world, but in the concept. And it was an European mistake. The European mistake was that for a long time, 20th century, uh, most of the Western people uh, spoke about their discoveries. And it is wrong. It, but it's not the, the word that is wrong, it's the subject that is wrong. Nowadays, as, I, as a scholar, I was trained not to say that. Because as a scholar, when I started to make my master's, that then delivered the thesis, the first year that I, I spent learning not Portuguese activities, but history of Asia, history of the Indian Ocean, history of Africa. So first I, I learned about the others, about the, the, the areas, the peoples, the geography of the other countries of the world to understand how the Portuguese acted, because the way how the Portuguese acted anywhere, including India or Japan, depending not so only of what was the Portuguese will, but mainly of what was the local people, interests, abilities, whatever. That's why, for example, very shortly, the Portuguese arrived to, to Calicut, and Calicut, the king of Calicut was not interested in that trade, but king of Kuching called immediately the Portuguese because he was a rival of Calicut, and he had spices to, to sell. He wanted arms to fight Calicut. So that's what, as in Japan, which was in the Sengoku Jidai, easily the Portuguese got allies from some of the daimyo against the other daimyo. This is a picture from the Namban Byombu. So it was the screens. And here is the curiosity. Here is the discovery. So yes, there was discoveries in this sense and that's the right sense of the word. So we, we have to change the, the, the concept, not the word. The word is good. We, because in the, in the 16th century or since the 15th century, uh, the world, mankind lived the age of discoveries in the sense that every society was alone. Most of them, as Japan, it was almost isolated. In Japan, the idea of the external world was the Senkoku, three countries, and then moved to Bankoku, infinite countries, because Ban 10,000, but actually meaning infinite, countless countries. So this is the, 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 the I think that I'd like to have this, this idea as one of the most important from my presentation. And look, uh, the memory of that arrival of the Portuguese in in Tanegashima by a chronicle, a Japanese chronicle written in the beginning of the 17th century is the chronicle of a discovery, the musket, tepoki, tepoki, tepo, the gunfire. So actually, even in Japan, it is acknowledgement of, yes, we discovered them. Yes, we discovered what they brought. And look at the left is the Tono, the statue in Tanegashima of the Tono, who was the ruler of the island in the name of the Shimazu of, uh, of Satsuma. And look, he's a samurai with his swords, but with a gunfire in his hand, because he's the, the statue, statue wants to, to, to make remember how important was this man, because it was the first Japanese authority who was the musket in its hands, and the musket later, through the ability and the genius of Hoda Nobunaga, ended or started ending the Sengoku Jidai after the Battle of Nagashino, when, for the first time uh, in the world, a battle was won by the fire of, a mus of muskets. And every year since, since then, nowadays, in Tanegashima in August, there is a festival about the, the Teppo. And then, of course, Xavier. Of course, that after the Teppo, it was Christianity that was also brought. Look, Christianity, uh, Christianity was born in Asia, moved to Europe and came back and arrived to Japan. Uh, but um, well, it was arrived as an European facade, but we are looking to look at the SM. Indian details, I will go back to Asian details. But uh, as Musket was an European arm with gunpowder that was invented by Chinese. So this was a globalization that was occurring with many, many discoveries or even religions thinking that had spread first in Asia that moved to Europe. And now Europe was bringing again in, in, in new, new shapes uh, again to Asia in other ways. I, I like very much this statue of Shevier that hundreds of thousands of, of statues of Shevier in Japan. This is in Oita late uh, ancient Funai. And this is very interesting because it is not only the missionary, but the route he made. Because this is very important in Japan, from what I know, is uh, how, how far they came. And this is important. And of course, India is in, in, in behind, is behind the statue, but India is there too. And it's important because the, 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 this mission of Xavier was prepared in Goa, it was prepared in India. The Portuguese, as I told you, the Portuguese who discovered or first encountered Japan were settled in Malacca. 
and they were privateers. They were not members of the crown, but they informed immediately the captain of, of the fortress, as well as the missionary, Xavier, who was there because he had gone to Molucas. And they presented him, it is on your left here, a samurai, Yajiro, who had the fight and he got the sanctuary in a Portuguese ship by 14, 15, 47, 48. And this Yajiro accepted to be Christian and came with them to Goa. And in Goa, it was in Goa that the mission was prepared and that the gospel, according to Matthew, was translated into Japanese. So the first translation of a Christian text to Japanese was done in Goa, with the support, of course, of a Japanese, but it was in India. And so it was from Goa that, and then Kuching that Xavier departed and sailed to Japan. And it made something different that was not, that was not uh, economically profitable, that he, he sailed directly to Japan. But it, because it was not the proper way, I will explain later, because finally in 1550, the, the, this trade that the Portuguese were starting, because as you know, there was a bad relationship between China and Japan, and, and, and as, a neutral, as a neutral party, the Portuguese were able to penetrate in that trade. And then as they were able also to secure uh, the mouth of the Pearl River from the Waco, they were accepted by the Chinese to be settled in Macau. And then, so they started this great uh, route that was um, awarded every year by the Crown to a veteran of India. So one of the Portuguese who were here, were here in India, supporting the state of the India, and as a reward, instead of, a, of, a, of more land that the country has not, so you get, you, get, you get business, go to business. The best, the best account and the best analysis of these uh, travels uh, you have ever here was done by Charles Boxer a long time ago. This, the, 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 but this uh, book is not repressible. It's, it's done. It's done. Can be added, but it's done. And this is the great shipper from Amacon. So the Portuguese have this uh, monopoly. And this ship was a very global ship because it sailed from Goa with a cargo of Gujarati textiles, which were traded for spices in Southeast Asia, trade, which was traded for, for silk in Macau, and finally to get the Japanese silver. And when coming back, they were bringing porcelains, copper, and lacquers from Japan. And in India, this business between China and Japan, it was evaluated in 10% of the annual amount of revenue of the Goa go with, go with um, customs. So it was very important also to India, the profits, the profits of this trip were, uh, benefit, were benefiting the Portuguese in Goa. Now beyond Namba and Biombo, this is very interesting because on the left you have uh, in the, the imagination of the Japanese about who, how should be India. Because you see that there the church is not in wood, but in stone and you see the elephants. So the two elements that distinguish from what is the non normally Japanese style uh, facade, like you see in, in the right, you see that the churches are in wood as, as all the temples in Japan. Looking more closely, here is India in the, in the imagination of the Japanese artists and here the arrival of the Portuguese. I have not much time, but look, for example, and what is discovery, the Portuguese that do not support to be over their knees I, I try that. I was saying it's it's dark. So over the knees, they prefer to be seated in a chair. So there is a slave bringing a chair for his master, as well as they always have dogs as puppets. And uh, as it was not normal in Japan, so this this Nambanjin coming claiming with these uh, with these pets. Okay, but this it's it, there are lots of of, of images like this in the man. But and also animals from India like the peacock. And it, it was it was something new. So the Japanese through the Portuguese were not discovering only European things, but world things, as the African people, as well as an Indian animal, which is the peacock. So that's why that's what was carrying in that ship. It's interesting. This is one. This is an, an article that we published in this bulletin of Portuguese Japanese studies I showed you, because in a, from the 1549 to 1582, before the, um, the creation of the vice province of the Jesuits in Japan, which was autonomous. Uh, the mission was dependent from Goa. And when the, the first missionaries started having a lot of baptisms, but um, in a mission that was uh, uh, running well, but uh, with some questions that were difficult for them, for example, can I baptize the guy? 
to to make fire in the pyre where his Buddhist father will be burned to ashes? They thought in Japan, they thought yes, in India, because the answer was not, it, it was written in India, but with an European mind, of course. Uh, it was no, they can't, they are Christian, they are Christian. Okay. But that, that's to say that how the Japan mission in the beginning, the missionaries were looking to India to have solutions for their own problems. And, uh, and then what is, I think, when the thing that comes from what we spoke first about the, the Buddhism. This is, a, a, this is a, in, in Nagasaki developed quickly a, a European style a painting a school. This is, if I, if I would not use, if I showed the, the Christ without the lac, lacquer, I think you should believe it was, it had been drawn in Europe, but it was drawn in Japan. But look the face. And I assure you that almost the Christ crucified, I saw crafts or drawn in Asia from Goa to Nagasaki. They have this face meaning the face of the Buddha. Not Christ suffering, but Christ enlightened as the enlightened Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha. And this is something that was not demanded by anybody. This is how, how the Asian artists that were compelled to, to work for Christians or that even got, got themselves Christian, but they didn't, they didn't lose all their memories of pre-Christians. And any, any Asian Christian could understand how, why, how did this God had been crucified as a thief. It was unacceptable. And so they moved and, and there was no inquisition that could avoid this. So this is another Christ, for example, but if it is in Europe, it's like this. This is the, the usual, very realistic. This is, well, look, this is realistic. Christ in the cross was not enlightened. Christ in the cross was suffering. Of course, he died in the cross, but when, but uh, is the difference between what is religious art in Europe, which is very realistic, or in Asia, which is much, much more metaphoric. Nobody believes that Shiva has three, six arms, uh, or much more than then, or Avalokiteshvara with all these hundreds of arms that can be represented. So it, it's a met metaphor, but in Europe, it's, it's not thinkable to do metaphors. We, it, we try to be realistic. And then who were the Portuguese? Because is, this is the same picture you, you, you chose. You chose for, it's also very interesting because look what, because I, why did I bring this here? Look here, we have, if you look well, the three guys uh, over are Europeans, are the older are Europeans. They have two slaves, Africans, and they are three boys. The three boys look Japanese. So the Portuguese can be Europeans, Africans, or Asians. Here, because it was a Japanese artist and because it was, uh, the, the ship that was uh, sailing between um, Macau and Nagasaki, most of these uh, Portuguese uh, father, uh, but uh, Asian born Portuguese, which were all of them from Asian mothers, because just a few of Portuguese women went, came to Asia in the 16th century. Of course, they should be Chinese. Most of them in Ch Nagasaki should be Chinese or uh, Japanese, but they could be also Indians, born in Goa, in Kuching, from at this time in the 80s, even from a father already born in India from, for example, Portuguese and a Persian or, or an Indian woman. And then, then that had married again, this, this mestizo son had again born, married with another women in India, women. So meaning that most of these Portuguese that are traveling in this Kurofne, they were Asians. And if they will take out these clothes and will dress with something from Asia, they look like Asians and they speak speak and they could speak the language of their mothers. And they understood the Buddhism, the Confucius or Shiva as no, one, no, no other European Portuguese would understand. So that's why there was all this Portuguese trade in Asia beyond the empire. It was because it was performed not by Europeans, white skinned people, Caucasians, but by these Asian Portuguese that are here, that, that, that are pictured here by the Japanese artists. Just finishing, this is the first embassy that uh, of Japanese who went to Rome through India. So who, when they went back, they could speak not by what the Portuguese, the, for the first time, Japanese could hear about India by Japanese. Gigi Wa Miguel, Ito Mancio, Nakaura Julian and Hara Martinho. These four, it was a, a tremendous success of the Jesuits, but they are remember, this is a statue that exists nowadays in close to Omura. 
this is the street, this is, this is the way from Wamura city to the airport, which is the Omura one, but is the airport of Nagasaki. The name of the airport is Nagasaki, not of Omura. Uh, Omura Sumitada, when gave Nagasaki to the Portuguese, will be losing for any years the name of the airport for the other city, not for his own capital. And look, that what is very funny that in this statue, that is very nice because it's looking to, to where, from where they, where they go, where did they went and they, from where they came. Look that they are very similar to this picture, but nowadays, respect for these half European, of these Jesuits, these girl, boys that all of them were Jesuits later. So, and then they have looked at their hair. So the Japanese style hair, despite uh, an European, an European, an European dress. And this is, this is uh, very nice. Just a word, say Gigi Miguel then apostatized. Tito Mansi was a priest and died before persecutions. Nakaura Julian was a martyr. And Ara Martini was an exile to Macau where he died. So four people, four destinies, completely different. But all of them with the memory of India that they for sure spread in Japan, finishing. So this is one of the best books about the Portuguese in Japan, is the history of Japan of Louis Freud, a hero that is very well considered even for by in, in the in Japanese intellectuals and historians of the 16th century. And it's, he reports that in 1584, uh, in the battle of that uh, the coalition Arima Shimazu fought against Ryuzoji Takanobu, who was the emerging power in Kyushu after the downfall of the Otomo house. In the Battle of Okinawa, uh, the, the, uh, where Takanobu died, actually, it was and the claim, Freud claims that that victory also was with the support of the Portuguese that from a boat were making fire with with a with a cannon, and that cannon was uh, make fire by a Portuguese, an African, and an Indian. Uh, from each time, between each uh, fire, they pray a Padre Nosso. But uh, then, and then they kill a little more people, and then they pray again. And, 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 but that's that say that Indians were there. Indians were there in Japan with the Portuguese. That's that's the move. And then just to finish, really finish, this is the the map to understand that is coming from India to Japan. These were the the fifths who were under a baptized daimyo before the Battle of Sekigahara. Not there were no missions in all of them, but it was even looking even Tsushima was a uh, Japanese uh, uh, baptized to say that all these uh, that the this influence of the Portuguese in Japan was strong. There were two possibilities: the one um, less natural of Oda Nobunaga to accommodate them and to use them as exotic, or to refuse them by suspicion, as Toyotomi Hideyoshi and then Tokugawa Ieyasu did, and went to Japan to Sakoku. And just to say that uh, I experienced all that also in my novels. I'm also a novel writer, and I, my last experience was to this trilogy mm -hmm. about, about the Portuguese in Japan and in India, which I also offer to Japan Foundation today. And thank you so much again for this uh, opportunity you conceded to me. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Professor Gosta. Uh, this is most fascinating. Uh, particularly, you know, the fact is, I just wonder the first Japanese who came to Goa and the first Indians who went to Japan, I wish one had accounts about, you know, what, what they felt. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, particularly, and, and the Japanese, how they reacted to the Nanbanjin who came mm -hmm. from there. That's most uh, interesting. Um, over to uh, you, Professor Helen Bhutan. Are you online? We have to take out this. Yes. Yes, hello, everybody. Um, so, um, thank you first to the organizers uh, of this wonderful event, which highlights, you know, the importance uh, of the interactions between India and Japan. And I'm really sorry I could not make the trip to Delhi. I would have loved, you know, being with you, but it was really impossible for me due to professional and personal uh, obligations. So, so I, I'm I'm deeply sorry, but thank you uh, for letting me you know, being with you, also virtually, uh, you know. Um, so thank you also to Professor Kosta for really this fascinating talk. And um, I would like maybe to emphasize uh, some points of uh, a Professor Kosta talk and maybe add, you know, and build up on what, uh, what he talked about. So um, firstly, Professor Kosta uh, reminded us that interaction uh, between India and Japan are quite old, in fact, 
but they are not evident. You know, it's, you know, very often when I'm talking with uh, European scholars, you know, specialized on European countries, for them, it's quite evident that since you are working on, you know, Asia and on interactions between, you know, India and Japan, there are, that these interactions are quite evident, but um, I don't think so, you know. It's something that is built over the time and during a long period. And also, uh, Professor Costa reminded us the role of Portugal in these interactions during the early modern period. And I think it's quite also important. And it is something that is now emphasized by the scholarship. That is the complexity of the interactions in the China Sea uh, with European, but also different Asian actors, you know, sailing across the seas, you know, especially as Professor Costa reminded us that on the Kurofune, you have, of course, Portuguese, but also, you know, people coming from Indonesia, India, and, uh, and so on. And your, po your PowerPoint shows very well how still today we can see in the public space, you know, in Japan, and through, for example, the statues, uh, you know, these very interactions, uh, which are still remembered by uh, the people. Um, so the Kurofune trade um, was not only a trade, you know, between China, Macau, and Japan, because very often when you read the scholarship, and of course, when you read Boxer, um, the trade is presented mainly as the route, the sea route between um, Macau and Japan and of course China. But the trade route begins in fact in Goa, the capital of the Ishtaduda, India. And so very often these interactions between India and Japan are overshadowed uh, by the links between China and Japan. Although, uh, you know, these economic, uh, religious, cultural interactions are quite numerous. And I think the Kurofune is a wonderful example of these exchanges, you know, between India and Japan. So in this very short comments, because I think we don't have much time, I would like to emphasize, you know, maybe several points on the Jesuits' presence in, uh, in Asia, since I'm, I'm a specialist of the, the Jesuit missions. And more specifically, uh, I would like to stress the links between Asia, uh, between India, sorry, and Japan. And we will come back, of course, to the Kurofune and to uh, some comments, um, you know, Professor Koshta um, did in his talk. So all the missions in Asia, all the Catholic missions in Asia and uh, under the, the guidance of the Society of Jesus uh, belong to an administrative framework of what we called the Indian province, whose center was in Goa. So in the early phase of the Jesuits' presence in India, there was only the Indian province, you know, and the Japanese and the Chinese missions were directly integrated inside the Indian province. So to, to put it another way, you know, the Japanese mission started off as an, an offshoot, as an extension of uh, the Indian province. And this pattern directly uh, reflected the organization of the Portuguese presence in India with Goa as the religious and as the administrative capital you know, of the Portuguese uh, Asian empire. So of course, Goa hence clearly intended to control the East Asian mission. So for example, the Goan authorities certainly would not leave you know, the East Asian missions to their own device. But as uh, Professor Koshta reminded us, the Japanese missions often turned to Goa for sp spiritual directions. And um, very often, as uh, Professor Koshta told us, uh, missionaries in Japan had what we call you know, spiritual doubts. You know, in Latin, they call it dubia. So, for example, can uh, a Christian convert marry a non-Christian? You know, it was the, the typical question that were raised in uh, the missionary field in Japan. And the important point is that the missionaries in Japan turns 
to Goa and not to Rome to answer these spiritual questions. Uh, we you know, could imagine that since Rome was the Catholic you know, center, the missionaries would ask the question in priority to Rome, but in fact, they preferred to turn to Goa. And I think that because it was you know, the Asian center for the missionaries, for the missions, the answers were think to be more accurate coming from Goa and coming from Rome, you know, with uh, a different culture, with um, a different uh, view of, uh, of religion. So they prefer to turn, in fact, to India than to, uh, than to Rome. So another way, you know, the, another link that you can have between uh, Goa and Japan uh, for, uh, you know, this, uh, from the missionary point of view, is that Goa was initially proactive in controlling the new mission in Japan. But for example, we have, um, you know, the, what we call the provincial, that is the, the head of, you know, the, the mission oh, in okay. India. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Technicians are doing something in control room. Se. Nay, could you bonus? Yes. Ma yeah. Hello? Yeah, we, we can see and hear you clearly. Balu Mashi, but me covat me are you? I think she's lost. Um coach being is nice. There was lips reading Pakara Ume Apki. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Samaj gaya? Uh, is it better? Kuch sir, kuch to bolo. Hello? Ha, yep. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Can you hear me? PPT presentation make problem ye hai ki jo PPT no, I, I, I can window 11 pe hai. और अभी हम विंडो 8 पे काम कर रहे हैं तो मुझे फिर इसको शट डाउन करना पड़ेगा वहां से पीपीटी कॉपी करनी पड़ेगी और यहां पे फिर दोबारा से पेस्ट करनी मैं दिखाना नहीं चाह रहा था पूरी शक्ल जी आई थिंक यू कैन गो अहेड एंड यू नो सॉर्ट ऑफ मे बी कंक्लूड योर कमेंट्स नाउ बिकॉज़ वी कैन हियर यू परफेक्टली वेल Okay, I, I yeah. hear you perfectly well too. Yeah. Uh, I, I was talking about the spiritual links we can say inside, you know, the missionary field in Asia between, uh, you know, India and Japan. No, and yes. I was, um, I was talking about a visit, you know, paid by um, uh, a prominent head of the the Jesuits in India to Japan in 1554. Uh, to boost, in fact, the, the missionary efforts in uh, in Japan. Um, and uh, the, my last point, you know, uh, I would like to emphasize how the Japanese missions was finan financially dependent on its Indian supervisor. So in the first year, uh, the financing of the Japanese mission depended essentially uh, from donation from the King of Portugal. But these donations were supplemented by the purchase of land in India by the Japanese Jesuits. So in fact, the Japanese Jesuits were uh, you know, owning land in India, especially in the north of the Goa, in the Basin area, in the Basin area, in the north of Goa. And the income from you know, in the Indian lands were then transferred to uh, Japan. So in fact, the Japanese mission was forced to rely on its Indian counterpart, were forced to rely on the Indian uh, mission for um, the funds, for, of course, a lot of objects that were, you know, on, that were sold on the Kurafune from Goa to, uh, to Nagasaki. Um, and also the, uh, the Jesuits in Japan invested, in fact, in the Kurafune. Now, to, to have also money, you know, more money, 
because uh, the money transferred from India, you know, sometimes you can have a shipwreck or, and so on. So sometimes they didn't receive the money. The Jesuits in Japan chose to invest themselves in the black ship, in the Kurofune. So of course, these investments were mainly purchased of raw silk bought in China. But if we take a close look at the list of objects purchased by the Jesuits and which were transported on the Kurofune, we find a variety of clothing in cotton, for example, which maybe came from India rather than China. So the sources are unfortunately quite silent on the purchase made by the Jesuits in India. Uh, if they were involved in, uh, in merchant networks, did they use intermediaries in India for the purchase? But um, I hope Professor that- Professor Wutan, can you just sort of conclude? I think we're running out of town time a little bit. Yes, I'm, I'm concluding. Uh, but I hope that in, in the near future, we will find more evidence, evidences of the strong financial and commercial links between India and Japan. Um, and thank you again to Professor Koshta to have high highlighted you know, these connections in the early modern period and to the organizers of this event. And I'm sure that this event will boost you know, research on this important topic of the interactions uh, between India and Japan during the early modern period. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Professor. And, and thank you for highlighting this centrality of Goa and the important role that Goa played really, particularly in, in, in respect of the, the Jesuit missionary work in Japan. Um, I think, uh, Professor, because of shortage of time, uh, I perhaps can take one question. Is there any question that we could have from the audience? We've had such a wonderful presentation. Or shall we keep it for the end? Yeah, I think, thank you again. Well, that, that was really a most uh, interesting session that we've had.